This is Catherine Getsky, host of the Hope Matrix podcast. We are here to share science, stories, and strategies for how to hope. I'm the Chief Hope Officer of the Shine Hope Company, and Shine is the mnemonic for how we teach hope. So when we talk about hope, we talk about how we use stress skills, happiness habits, inspired actions, nourishing networks, and eliminating challenges, which are our thinking patterns that get in the way of our ability to hope. Hope is a skill. You can measure hope, you can teach hope, and you can start practicing skills to activate higher hope in your life today. And on this Hope Matrix podcast, we aim to bring in guests, experts in science, people with stories, and those that have strategies for activating hope in your life. Hi, this is Katherine Getsky with The Hope Matrix. Thank you all for tuning in today. I'm super excited to talk to you. We talk about all all things science stories and strategies relating to hope and kind of how to maintain a hopeful mindset no matter what life challenges you're facing. So today I'm really excited to have with me Jamie Kelly who I know through work. She's a colleague of mine and we've worked on some projects together in the past. And um, she is also a mom of two dyslexic children. And she is here today to talk to us both from the standpoint of being a parent of someone with dyslexia and also um, from children's. You know, this is a population that has a much higher and can potentially have a much higher level of anxiety and depression and hopelessness. And so we're looking to see how can we maintain hope dealing with some of the challenges. So thank you so much for being here today, Jamie. Good to see you. It's good to see you. Thank you. You know, I always love any chance I get to to come and, and mix work and pleasure getting to visit with you. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. And it's pretty ironic because it's actually Dyslexia Awareness Month, too. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. And I think it kind of, you know, gets gets thrown in with every, you know, with everything else. But, uh, but you know, I, I thought the timing of this was fantastic. And as you know, dyslexia is something that, you know, we've been talking about um, in conjunction with hope uh, and the work that you do as, you know, obviously I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the work that your organizations do. And, um, and when we started talking about that, as it relates to dyslexia, I mean, you know, it just really hit home to me. So. Yeah, that's, that's great. And so happy to have you here and talking to our listeners today about this. Um, Hopelessness is defined as a feeling of despair and a sense of helplessness, and it's often a consequence of oppression. So when we're oppressed in any way, and I think those with dyslexia have a lot of challenges that others don't necessarily mm-hmm. have. And so when we talk about the dis- despair and helplessness, it's, it makes sense that it's high in this population. And so our goal is really to get strategies out to help support people so that they can deal with it in a proactive way. And, you know, you are a shining example ever since I've met you of doing that and being a real advocate for those with dyslexia for your children. And so I'm really grateful to have you here today so that you can share some of that with our audience. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I I did not uh, in any way feel the calling to be a teacher. And thank goodness my children, uh, you know, are surrounded by lots of great ones. Um, but that's not to say, you know, if we look back even historically, dyslexia has not been something um, that was either understood or diagnosed. I mean, even up, up until, you know, recent history. I mean, I think Steven Spielberg was just like diagnosed in his late 50s, 56, I think. Um, but I, I mean, you know, there's just, there was generations of people who just, they just thought you couldn't read. Um, and it's not about not being able to read. It's just being able to learn to read differently and, and really reading from a different part of their brain. So, um, it, you know, that has not, we've really, really come a long way, even in like the last four years with like dyslexia legislation and protection in schools. And there's, you know, up until very, very recently, and even today, there's there's some states that don't, you know, recognize dyslexia um, the way that it needs to be for accommodation. Yeah, and I think when you talked, I mean, when we talked um, before about this, you talk about how dyslexia is often misdiagnosed or it's not caught. And so what are the some of the signs and symptoms that people can look out for? 
Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, um, in my experience, there's a few things, but one of which is a lot of um, false information. Um, I, today, most people associate dyslexia with seeing letters backwards, um, when in fact, that's not that's not an accurate um, description, right? They don't, and they see this as this, like that they can't read. There's a lot of other things involved with dyslexia. Dyslexic kids have, you know, more trouble with um, say things like executive function um, and spelling and handwriting even. Um, and it's often accompanied by other neurological differences like um, say anxiety or, uh, or a likelihood to anxiety or um, even just things like ADHD. Um, so, uh, and a lot of times, you know, my son was a, you know, I have two kids with very, very different stories. And my son, um, man, we did that kid. We, he tested ahead and everything he read two grade levels ahead when he was in second grade, man, he couldn't pass a 12, a 12 word spelling test to save his life and got to the point where, and he couldn't, you know, start when they were learning to write, he couldn't, you know, he just kind of couldn't get writing. And they were like, oh, he's left-handed. He's a boy. He tests fine. Um, and, you know, thank God, um, David Hansen, um, I knew him already and he is, I, I've introduced you to Dave. He's, he's one of my very favorite people, um, on the planet and especially when it comes to this space. Um, but David was able to, you know, we, we had Landon actually tested, um, when David was at the university of Arkansas. And so, um, and it, David came back and was like, well, here's the problem, right? Like <laughs> there he's they're giving him second grade dyslexia screeners and his vocabulary is at a fifth grade level. So they're saying, no, he doesn't read like a dyslexic. Um, and that's kind of called often called stealth dyslexia, um, or it's a combination of kind of a higher IQ, um, and dyslexia. So it kind of masks it. They're really able to overcompensate in other ways. Um, but once we figured out, we're like, oh, duh. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it took someone knowing what to look for and looking past a multiple choice test um, uh, to see what was really going on. Because I can remember being in tears sitting across from a room full of people who I know with all their hearts learned to help my son um, just because he was so ahead in everything else. And um, just a great kid. And, and they, I know they all wanted to help him, but when you sit across from the people that you are looking to as a parent to help educate your child and they're going, yeah, uh, I don't know really like this isn't working. You know, he doesn't, he tests this way. Uh, we don't really know what to tell you. That was a very difficult conversation to have. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, in those situations, it can be misdiagnosed. Oftentimes, um, kids kind of, it gets real noticeable around um, fourth grade um, when kind of the reading levels catch up to them. And um, and then at that point, you know, oftentimes they're labeled as lazy or not trying hard enough or, you know, just not wanting to read. And, um, and then when they're younger, like my daughter, my daughter had very, very different characteristics. We, you know, we were, I was on alert. I knew that if my, if a sibling had it, then she statistically is more likely to. So, you know, we were aware of that and we already had dyslexia specialists in place. And so, um, but, but her reading level wasn't the same and hers presents entirely differently. And she has an easier time with writing than he does. And so even in my own house, I can see the difference um, in how academically it's, visible and then also how emotionally they they kind of uh excel those things <laughs> excel those things because they're very different personality type too so i feel like i just live in like a little bit of of multiple um kind of reactions to that um but it's the one thing that's common is you know both of them I've been in tears multiple times saying I'm the, you know, I, I'm the dumbest kid in my class or, you know, I, I, I'm not good at this or I feel like a baby when I have to ask my friends for help spelling a word or, you know, they, they come home with those things. And, um, and that's stuff that doesn't, you know, dyslexia doesn't stop at the end of a school day. Yeah, absolutely. So, and that's why I love what you guys are teaching with hope so much because, you know, it does not stop at the end of the school day. Um, and parents like me, I mean, I, how do you, I can't fix this. Like I, yeah. it's not going to go away. I can't fix it. So my goal, um, you know, was really just, I'm not an educator. I am going to, uh, support and, 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 
and encourage and help those like you um, and David Hansen and Access Learning Academy and um, IFRED and all these great organizations that are doing things to address uh, to address this. I mean, especially when it, you talk about getting it in the hands of parents and teachers, because that's where you're going to get into impacts of like multiple people versus who, you know, just, you know, you, you or I working with just my kids or just, you know, um, obviously just the one is important, but man, when you, the way that you're doing things and get kind of get more, getting this out in the hands of everybody is just, it's beautiful. And um, anyway, thank you very much for what your group does and, and how you guys just keep doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you spoke there too, to the sense of helplessness that you would feel as a parent yeah. and, you know, also as a child. And, and we have a thing that we have our students do called control the controllables and think about, you know, what can we change about this and what can't we change? And there's so much about dyslexia that you can't change. And so it's really important to maintain that sense of hope to focus on what you can kind of change and how you, you know, can advocate. So is there a specific screener? Like if, if our listeners are thinking their kids are having challenges with spelling or reading or, you know, writing, are there standardized screeners that they can check out? Yeah, there, there, you know, obviously you can find some screeners online. The most efficient thing to do and, and what I would advise anyone to do is, you know, if you feel like your, tr your child is struggling, first of all, not all literacy issues are dyslexia, you know, so there's that. And, and in any situation, if you, you know, use your gut and, and don't be afraid to advocate for them. Um, and, and sometimes it takes raising your hand more than once when, you know, everything else is really great for them, but they're just not into reading is, you know, that's a difficult thing when you just know something's off. Um, I, the best, best thing I would encourage anyone to do is reach out to their school and ask the school to screen them. Um, and they'll share those results with you. And if they come back and say, Hey, you know what? Looks like you, you know, your child shows characteristics characters is, uh, now I can't say of dyslexia, um, you know, they will give you those reports and then they'll be able to within your district, hopefully work with them and, and get them into some, some individualized um, or some group um, accommodations there. Yeah, wonderful. That's super helpful. And I think, you know, with the brain, the brain is the most complex organ of the human in the human body. And as with mental health, there is so much that we don't know and that we're learning. So getting second, third opinions, uh, you know, I know that you've worked really hard to do that and to advocate for your child and to follow your gut instinct, as well as what professionals tell you, I think is really kind of important. Yeah, the other thing to remember is that it's not one and done. Um, unfortunately, you know, throughout school, there's going to be different things. Um, the smartest thing, the best thing that we, we did was uh, put a 504 in place um, that allows um, our kids to, you know, be accommodated. For example, things like removing, uh, taking away them having to take notes off of the board um, was an absolute game changer for us because um, it would trigger my son's anxiety. He would come home like in tears, um, you know, it, because by the time he was finished trying to write down what the teacher had written on the board, the other kids had already been working on their problem and now it became homework for him. And he already had a hard time with it. You know, these kids are working 10 times harder in school because, you know, it, it, the parts of your brain that are used are just very different, but they have so many, really, really, really awesome things about them. And, and, you know, we talk about that a lot, a lot at home. Um, dyslexia is also their superpower. And, and uh, with that though, like all of their superheroes, everybody has, you know, even Superman has a kryptonite. And, uh, you know, for my kids, we say that might be uh, reading and writing is, is kind of their kryptonite right now or, or writing and spelling um, is their kryptonite. But man, look at all these other great things that uh, they get to do and and look at what we would be losing if we didn't have some of these great dyslexic thinkers um, out there. I mean, some of the greatest um some of the greatest minds and innovations uh, in history. I mean, you wouldn't have the iPhone or uh, Microsoft and, uh, you know, that's just a really, really cool thing. I mean, we, we wouldn't have electricity without a dyslexic thinker. So um, things like this podcast would have never happened without those really, really brilliant minds and that creativity. And um, even when we get into the arts, I mean, Picasso, I mean, some of the greatest like artists at all time is the, 
creativity is amazing. So, you know what, reading and writing is difficult. It's not impossible. They need to learn it differently. Um, and I just really encourage, they feel the negative all the time. Um, I encourage them to just really embrace things that, and, and, and build those strengths that they're going to rely on. Um, my son is in forensics um, and debate um, because that's teaching him. He's naturally, you know, he's quick witted and a fast thinker and great with words. Um, but so I'm, I want to encourage him to hone his presentation skills. I don't mean that, you know, he's going to be pitching e-commerce with me just yet, but um but I mean, it does give him the confidence to stand up and do things like, hey, instead of turning in a written report, I'm going to do a video with an audio recap of the book that I listened to. Um, things like that get creative. They love it. Um, the teachers are usually, you know, most educators will work with you in that space to kind of accommodate things so that they don't feel like they're sticking out like a sore thumb either. And, and that's one of the things that um, I think you just have to be that I'm most cautious of is, you know, it's not something I want them to be ashamed of. That's part of who they are. And it's part of the brilliant things that they're going to do later in life. But I want to give them all the tools that they can emotionally, academically. Um, I think there's a lot of technology benefits in there. Um, but I want them to be able to be emotionally strong because if they're emotionally strong, they can handle all this other stuff. You know, I mean, uh, when was, you know, when was the last time that you hand wrote a letter to someone? So, you know, like we can go, okay, we can accommodate those things in technology. We can't stop anxiety and depression when they feel like the this, uh, this stupid kid in class or when they are embarrassed. Like we, we can't accommodate that, right? And so yeah. that's why, you know, I think hope cur curriculum in schools is just so, so important. Yeah, thank you. And that leads to the, you know, that feeling of despair. So that anxiety, that um, feeling of sadness, the anger, like all of those feelings that are coming up on a regular basis. And I'd like to look at it just from, for, from the perspective of you as a parent and also from the kids and what kind of you all are doing about it and how your kids are doing with those feelings and then how, what's kind of tools they're using to help, to help get them through that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I, uh, my eight year old, um, we always laugh because every, every time she wants to go write something, she goes up to our Google net and says, Hey Google, how do you spell friends? Uh, and you know, and she, cause she's determined and she is not, you know, she is a very independent, uh, young lady, but, um, she, you know, watching her just adapt technology effortlessly. We never taught her to do that. She just walked up and started asking Google those things. Um, Microsoft, uh, had, and I can post some links uh, to a site we're, we're putting together now, uh, supportdyslexia.org. Um, Microsoft has done some really, really great work in that space, um, you know, with dyslexia-friendly uh, technology and, and applications built natively into all of their programs, which is really cool. Um, the best thing that, that we really do is we use dyslexia um, as a character trait or as a skill set. Um, Richard Bronson did that beautifully. I thought it was like the coolest, like the total geek in me. Um, Richard Bronson, I had read an article where he came out and said that, you know, uh, he was going to put dyslexic thinking as a skill set in LinkedIn. And I was like, that's amazing. Like, that's just the coolest um, thing for them to go and see. And when, so we do things like, we watch Shark Tank. Uh, several of the sharks on Shark Tank are dyslexic. You know, we watch the Made by Dyslexia videos with Kira Knightley and Orlando Bloom talking and Jamie Oliver, like talking about how dyslexia changed, you know, shaped them or what, what they deal with today. Um, literally some of the most brilliant minds of all time and, and some of the greatest innovation we have ever had as a, as a world, not just as a country, have come from these awesome, awesome brains. Um, and that's what, that's what we lean on because, you know, and I know, like, we're always going to be, that's human nature, I think, to be more self-critical. Um, so I just want to make sure that, I guess in a weird way, I can combat any negative feeling that they might have about themselves with like 10 other positive ones that they automatically, you know, rattle off. And um, it was really cool for my, to hear my son do it one day. He said something like, yeah, uh, 
my hand my handwriting stinks uh i'm dyslexia i'm dyslexic it's my thing and he was like so are 40 percent of self-made millionaires and richard bronson and percy jackson uh although he ended up being a demigod and he just kind of casually like glazes past it and i love seeing that because it's not something that he is viewing as um like oh i have this death it's not a it's not a problem it is it, it's it's it causes, it complicates things, um, but it's there. And it's, and it's, you know, part, part of that is the reason um, that they are just as awesome and brilliant as they are. Yeah, no, that's, and I love how you've turned it so much for them and, and focused on the positives and kind of what you can control and the benefits out of it. Um, and yet the reality is there are probably days when they're super sad or they're super oh. anxious. And, and what are skills to get through that? I mean, is it just crying it out? Is it, you know, do they get in nature? Or do they exercise? Is like, how do they get that energy? Is it creating an art? Is there anything specific? Yes. We, uh, that's a great question because, you know, a, a lot of it differs from the personality of my kids. I've got one that like really wants to like talk through it and, and articulate things. And I've got the other one who, um, just lost her feeling vulnerable is just she just I mean if she can't do something it just makes her feel mad like she expresses that with like um, you know very competitively um so you know in those ways it's different but the one thing I found consistent with my kids and all the you know very commonly with with I think probably all the dyslexic kids that I know you know with friends and stuff is that uh, a few things one 20 percent of people are dyslexic so, I mean, in reality, more people, what, more people are dyslexic than that are left-handed. I've got, def, I've got two left-handed dyslexics, so I don't know what that says about that. But, um, but I do think that uh, creativity is a real core. Um, we have been able to use that in so many ways and engage them when they're frustrated about school projects. You know, doing things like, hey, if it's a book that your child's assigned to reading and it's just, it's really exhausting when they get home, they've read all day and they go, or, you know, they've worked hard. You know, audiobooks count. There's tons and tons of research showing that audiobooks have the same effect um, in your brain. And, and so, like, use those things and you get creative. Let them do um, PowerPoint presentations, things that will actually, they will use later on in life. Those skills they'll use through in elementary all the way into their professional careers likely and if you can teach them to learn how they learn best and do things the way that they do um tapping that creativity is fantastic um we do a lot of just pro i mean just my son's a character creator my daughter is a slime chemist um just really anything that kind of lets them kind of feel like they're you know um getting to express themselves and, and not being judged and, um, you know, not having to worry about what someone else thinks. So um, I, I've realized a lot that creativity seems to be the most consistent thing that really gives them an outlet to, to work on. Yeah, that's great. And that, I mean, the part of, that's the part of hopelessness, that despair. So getting from that sadness, that grief, you know, mourning the loss of things that you maybe can't participate in, acknowledging it and moving on to what you can. So focusing on what you can do, um, but still expressing those feelings. Because if we repress our feelings, it can often lead to addictions, um, you know, all kinds of behaviors that aren't kind of helpful for us later in life. So that's a really um, important part of that. Um, and another thing, so we talk in hopelessness, we talk about going from um, helplessness, so that feeling that you can't do anything, and we address kind of the controlling the controllables. But, you know, one thing we teach our kids, too, is to set SMART goals, which are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time time bound. So very kind of specific goals. Are there those, do you use those kind of goals with your kids? I mean, are um, does that help at all? Have you... Yeah, goals are, you know, we like goals a lot because, um, you know, we, we kind of tend to look at them as, as, you know, I try to tend to, well, I say I can say a goal with one kid and I say a challenge with another, right? So, um, but, uh, or, or I can go back to my Walmart days and I can say, you know, it's an area of opportunity. But, um, but yeah, we, you know, setting goals is great. I think um, being realistic 
Um, I don't ever, you know, when I talk about accommodating or working with their teachers on, on workloads and what they're doing, um, it's not getting them out of things. Uh, it's just, it's, it's difficult when they, you know, let them give them a break. Like it doesn't hurt anything to let them listen to the audio book. And, and, you know, we always encourage to like listen to the audio book, um, you know, as they get older and chapter books and stuff. And then also just kind of reading along with it. So I literally get a copy of each, um, anytime it's available, I grab a hard copy and I grab a digital copy. A, then they can't get out of it and say, I love my book at home. Um, but also, uh, they, you know, they can listen and, and read along as well. That's, um, so, but setting goals of like, hey, it, it, it might not be realistic for your student to read all five books this semester, but not everybody in the class needs to know that. Work with your teacher and say, hey, you know, how about we do three or, you know, whatever it is and we'll, we'll do them in the same, but like get, have those conversations. They are usually more than willing um, to work with you and let your teachers help set those goals. Um, and, and you know, to goals that you're comfortable, comfortable with for your child and, and that still stretches them. Um, I think the last thing we want to do is, you know, not stretch them um, because there's so much potential in there, but we need to do it in a way um, that makes sense and, and is achievable. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the attainable part of the SMART goals. You know, we have to set attainable goals. So, and the other really um, key thing around goals is when they feel too big to kind of chunk them down. And it sounds like you mm -hmm. use some of that in the, you know, working with your kids. Yes, we use a lot of that, actually. Um, David Hansen, again, was, you know, he, he, that was one of those things that, you know, you don't know what you don't know um, as far as when you're talking about accommodations or what will help or what, what won't help. Um, and so thank goodness we, you know, we had resources and knew who to, who to reach out to. But one of the things that I never would have, you know, really thought about that made a remarkable difference is, you know, in a spreadsheet. So, you know, if you take something that's an entire page long, um, full of questions and, and these kids are like, you know, all these words are jumbling a bit, like it's, it's overwhelming. Um, and they're less likely to do it. So, but when you, when we started chunking it up a bit, um, especially when, um, uh, when they're a little younger, they don't feel like they are, um, being babied in the room or, you know, uh, that kind of thing, but it does give them a more, oh, okay, cool. Like I, yeah, I already know those four questions. Right. And then like move on to the next one. Um, and things like that are just fantastic. And then also um, one thing that we've really noticed with, and obviously the new switch to COVID, um, but we had actually noticed before is our, my son has dysgraphia as well, which is common. Um, it not, it's not common, but it's, it's commonly with dyslexia, with dyslexia. Um, so his handwriting is, is very difficult for him to read. And it, and he's got all these great things that need to come out of his mind. And it's hard for him to get it out there. Both of my kids, um, and, and I've seen it work. He's in seventh grade now. So, I mean, I've seen it work from the time, you know, they were little to now. Um, it's been, they've been, you know, they've loved having the, um, iPads. They both intuitively search with voice. Um, they text with voice that as a parent got when they figured out how to do that, um, they got very long. Um, but, but yeah, there's things like that, even just in, you know, you can voice text your word document and then focus on teaching them to proofread it so that they can learn more of that skill than the skill of having to think of how to spell each and every one of those words. Um, just little accommodations like that, honestly, they really, really do make a difference. Um, sometimes pull, ask, let them get pulled out for a test. Let them take a test with someone else, um, you know, uh, alone in a class or, or, you know, when they're not so worried about time or just to have extra test taking time. Um, but ask, you know, don't let them struggle and, and um, they're, or they're going to struggle, but don't, there are always things that you can do. Lord knows I just do not need to be the one that teaches my kids how to, how to read. I, I, I don't know. I, we would all not go very well if, uh, if I were now responsible exclusively for their education. Um, but let's get education in the hands of these teachers. Let's get hope curriculum 
in the hands of all these teachers so that they can touch the lives and teach this in classrooms of every kid that ever steps in their doorway. And then it's not, oh, I have to go learn how to deal with emotions. It's, oh yeah, I've been working. I already know what this is. I know what this feels like. And I, and I think today kids are more articulate than ever and um, they're feeling a lot more of these things. You know, let them express it. Let them set up a YouTube channel that literally only, you know, doesn't really go anywhere. I mean, let them set up a fake YouTube channel. Let them talk about it um, or let them not talk about it. You know, I think that um, really just comes down to, to, to your point of like, just don't let them feel hopeless because there's no reason to be. And when they're having those days, go show them all the cool stuff that has been like that the world has benefited from, from minds just like theirs. Um, and then they get to kind of walk into school a little coffee being like, yeah, I have dyslexia. Cool. Um, and, uh, and we literally saw it one day. So, you know, it was a, uh, it's a neat thing, but I, yeah. that emotional part and that hope that it's going to be fine and everything does not feel like fourth grade math. Like yeah. the rest of your life is not going to feel like fourth grade math all day, every day, right? Like that's not what we want these kids growing up thinking they have to look forward to is, is more difficulty. Yeah, um, why, when, why, when they can do such great things? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and another thing we talk about um, with hope and maintaining hope is the importance of, of um, networks and having a hope network. So, and not just people that are around, but people that are really supportive and encouraging and um, mm -hmm. have positive influences on both your kids and, and uh, parents. So are there good networks and are there good ways that you found to set up networks for the kids and for yourself and going through this? Yeah. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I was very fortunate, um, you know, to, to, to be friends with the Hanson family, um, David and his wife, Andrea, both um, in this space are just absolutely um, angels. They've dedicated their lives to it. Um, you know, they support organizations like, you know, Access Learning Academy out there teaching teachers um, how to identify dyslexia and how to, to teach the science of reading. Um, talk to talk to look at Facebook. There's lots of uh, groups on support groups on Facebook, dyslexia groups on Facebook. I'm part of a, of a couple myself. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to cruise through that every now and then and hear someone be like, Oh, I just found out my child has dyslexia. I don't know what to do. And you see all these feelings um, from other parents, I think um, is really helpful. Just, you know, just as a, as a mom. Um, and then I think, Man, there, we'll put a link up uh, again. We'll, we, we're working on our, our site, supportdyslexia.org. Um, we're going to have some, some really good links in there just to um, Child Mind Institute or, you know, Made by Dyslexia, the amazing site Microsoft has done in that space. Um, you know, obviously, I, Fred, and your organization. So I really, it, that's really just going, that's all the purpose of that really um, is, is, is for, Hey, what do I do? Um, or who can I call? So, uh, we'll definitely get that posted and make sure that, that your listeners have that information. Um, but yeah, just talk about it. I mean, advocate for it. And when you start talking about all these cool things, um, everyone's attitude changes about it. But what about, so what about your kids though? How do they get support too? Like, are they, are they ostracized from friends and made fun of? No, no. Well, right now with COVID, a uh, different story, but no, I mean, for them, you know, they love their groups of, uh, you know, they've got, I know my daughter Cameron um, loves when she gets to kind of go to this uh, small group time um, with other kids that have dyslexia in, in her school. So she doesn't feel like the only one in the class doesn't get it. Not that she is isolated at all times, but like in certain, you know, in, in those certain areas, um, make sure that, you know, they get to see, uh, my kids, um, let them get that energy out. They both uh, participate in the parkour uh, at a local gymnastics thing. They love it. Um, you know, it's a great way to physically, you know, kind of express themselves and get out there, you know, get out their energy. Um, I know you're a hiker. Um, that's another one, you know, uh, just kind of getting out and, um, you know, we do some camping and, you know, play at the river and stuff. And, and just, you know, again, 
we try to remember that it's going to be frustrating. Um, but it's not it, uh, you know, take, uh, take technology from Tony Stark and let's talk about Iron Man, right? Like there's, there are certain things that we just, uh, these kids need to realize it's not something that they need to, you know, we need to show them that they can achieve so many other things. So for them having some achievements outside of that, a lot of these kids are very musical, very creative. Um, my daughter's recently started piano and like loves it. It's something she's kind of, her memory is really auditory. So as my sons, they're both naturally good at it. Um, I, you know, those types of things are, are fun for them. It's a confidence booster and it becomes an outlet uh, for them as well. Um, whether it's, you know, painting or running or whatever, but it gives them a sense of achievement um, as well personally. Like even if it's, a, you know, I, I'm an advocate for, you know, just individual sports and stuff as well, just so they can um, be able to feel in control of how, you know, of, of that part, let them have control over something. So, um, and, and something that makes yeah. them feel good. Yeah. And I think that's a great suggestion. I mean, you want to, if kids are struggling in school and if, you know, with dyslexia and you're seeing that they're not connected with kids, I mean, one of the most important things for maintaining hope is having those connections. And so finding other ways for your kids to connect with other kids through art, through sports, through just different ways that isn't so scholastic. But where they're not focused on their weaknesses. They spend, you know, when we yeah. think about this, man, it's against human nature. They spend their entire school day doing something that is, it is against their, or not against, but like that is focusing on all the things that they struggle with the most. And if we put any of us in a room or in a job um, where we exclusively focus on the things that we did not as well, or that we struggled with, um, it's going to wear on you when you feel like you're not great uh, at anything. You know, at that point, you are struggling with every single thing that you're doing. Um, so I think for that reason, like when you could put them in something like parkour or even running, uh, let them run. Like that's those are things that they can be a proud of and accomplish. And they can see that like it doesn't matter if uh, I have trouble remembering how to spell something or if somebody, you know, if my handwriting is bad it doesn't matter. Like those things don't matter. And I think if all they see are the things that measure their weaknesses, um, that's a pretty rough thing for a kid to look at. It's a rough thing for an adult to look at. So, um, so for me, yeah. that's what I would suggest. Yeah. And the research around that is you have to, you have to say five positive things for every negative thing you say, um, to have positive, you know, cr really, um, productive, engaging relationships with people. So to have healthy work relationships, school relationships, five positives to one negative, you know, for your husband and wife, all of that. And it's, when you think about it, it's much easier. We focus much more on the negative. And I would assume that's in, especially true in that population. You know, they're dealing with so much of what they're struggling in. So it's important really to focus on a lot more of the positives and find the positives and continue to emphasize those. So, yeah, that's this has been so wonderful and helpful. I do full disclosure. So our Hopeful Minds curriculum, you know, it doesn't focus on dyslexia. It's a very general curriculum. And right mm -hmm. now it's not exactly dyslexia friendly because it is all. And we yes. talked about this yesterday. But we've been, exciting. but we, but we, we've been talking about this. So you, you guys are yeah. well, we, you guys are well on your way. I said, they have to be able to use it. I know, absolutely. But it does show how to have a hopeful mindset, yes. kind of no matter what you're mm -hmm. dealing with in life. And the curriculum yes. itself can be adopted for this population, the specific lessons. Because Absolutely. It, and it wouldn't take, I mean, obviously you guys have done such a great job with that. It's beautiful, beautiful. Um, I I am so excited about that because it that, you know, I'm going to, I'll be cheesy here, uh, but intentionally and uh, and unintentionally, but you know, it makes me feel hopeful um, to know that there are people out there like you and, you know, like David and Andrea Hansen and, you know, all these great educators um, and, and, and really just people that are being instrumental voices and of change out there. It's a hopeful feeling, you know, that there's somebody out there thinking, Hey, how can we fix this? Because when we can, 
I heard someone say before, like you, you can keep pulling bodies out of the river all day long, but at some point we need to go upstream and figure out why they're falling in in the first place and why they're getting there. Right. So, I mean, yes, we need to keep pulling them out of the river. Absolutely. But maybe let's try to keep them from falling so deeply into it as well. Um, and that's, so it's encouraging and, and it, it's definitely um, gives a lot of hope to, you know, parents like me who feel I'm not a teacher. What do I do? I'm not a teacher. Like, what do I do? Um, and so I thought, I'll do the only thing I can do. I will connect as many people that I think need to be connected to each other to have great conversations as I can. And I will really hope uh, that they all turn out as awesome as you and, and Dave Hansen. So. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I mean, to all our listeners out there, if you're struggling, if you have children that are struggling, know that you yeah. are definitely not alone. And there are one in five. Yeah, absolutely. One in five. And why don't we end with you just talking? I love when you talk it on your little rampage of or your big rampage of um, superheroes and just people. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I just want to end on that because I think it is so important to remember that no matter what kind of challenges you face or, you know, um, children face or that we encourage them that there are so many powerful people that have overcome challenges. Mm-hmm. And have used it for their advantage. So why don't we kind of end on that note with you? Oh man, yeah, you know you hit my my favorite spot because it was the only thing like I I wanted to do was to show my kids positivity. And thank goodness there's so many of them. Um, but you know you look at Thomas Edison, Richard Bronson, uh, Walt Disney was dyslexic. So get rid of all Disney characters. Without you know without these dyslexic minds, um, man, we. Uh, Orlando Bloom, Kira Knightley, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, Henry Winkler. I mean, they're, I mean, some of the greatest actors and actresses of our time, um, some of the greatest artists of our time, Picasso, uh, Steven Spielberg is dyslexic. Some of the greatest, um, ca- uh, Captain Underpants, uh, the, the author of Captain Underpants, sorry, not Captain Underpants, no, uh, dyslexic. There are brilliant authors who are dyslexic. Authors, think about that. These are kids that struggle with literacy, and people that struggle with literacy their entire lives and they're phenomenal like authors. And that comes from their creative place. It comes because they create these amazing characters that everybody adapts to. So it's endless. It doesn't matter what area your kids are into. Um, give them an assignment of finding all the cool things about dyslexia or looking at five cool things about it. Um, it's, it's really interesting there. And, and the list of, I believe, I think Tom Cruise is dyslexic. Uh, Tom Holland is dyslexic. Jamie, uh, Jamie Oliver, you know, it's a really, really cool um, thing when they get to start seeing some of their favorite actors or actresses um, say that. And, and uh, my son, I know, you know, he'll watch a movie and he'll randomly be like, Oh, Joe's dyslexic. And then like it moves on, but like, he's just like, Oh yeah, cool. That's like, you know, that's like me. Um, so for me, that's the most fun, um, the, the most fun way to kind of encourage and make it cool. And it's just, you know, at, I've made such a big deal about the superhero thing in my house and, you know, about even, you know, a tiny piece of kryptonite, kryptonite would render Superman, you know, useless. Uh, and he's Superman, you know, Tony Stark, no technology, uh, those things happen and, and it's different, right? So when we get to show them real life superheroes that are change makers and innovating and doing things, the Bill Gates and Steve Jobs of the world that are doing things like that, I think it gives them a whole nother level of what dyslexia is. Um, to the point that my kids are like, yeah, yeah, I know. But you know what? You hear them at a store and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm dyslexic. So is da, 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 da. And it's, and it's, you know, it's really cool then to kind of hear them feeling a little um, braggy about it. And it's so easy because all it is is like letting them research something fun like that, which is also a great uh, project to give them in school. Yeah, absolutely. We do hope superheroes or hope heroes. And so it's great. You know, we could do that all specific to those with dyslexia. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you you so much. Yeah, it's so important to get the message out. And the work you're doing is so great as as a parent and how you have looked at it all and how, you know, you're working through all those challenging emotions and all those that that sense of helplessness and you're still moving to hope. 
um, which anyone can read. Every day. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Every moment. Of a, yeah. Every day. Yeah. And it's that continuum. So, um, yeah, I want to thanks. And as you said, we'll put a lot of the links um, so the listeners can check out um, some of the work you're doing and some of the experts, you know, and resources in the space. So that's wonderful. We'll put that in the. Yeah, and uh, if it's all right, I'd like to end with, uh, I'll let you know that we are going to develop uh, a shirt on supportdyslexia.org that all the proceeds of that will go towards uh, your developing dyslexia-friendly hope curriculum for students. So um, we'll make sure that you guys have that link and and, uh, and we're going to do a, a really cool, just limited time shirt um, just to kind of talk about hope and dyslexia and really get that out there. So we'd love to, to do that and donate all those proceeds to, to your curriculum and the work that you guys are doing, because if, you know, we, we need a, a million and one more of you. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. And yeah, I feel the same about you. We need a million and one more of you. So yeah, thanks. Hope you all, all you listeners enjoyed today's broadcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Hope Matrix. And we will look forward to talking again soon. So thank you all for listening in to the Hope Matrix podcast. Um, we want to shine a light that hope is teachable, hope is measurable and teachable, and provide you with actionable insights for how you can start activating hope in your life today and provide a framework so you can start talking about hope with other people and practice these skills together because we are better with hope. Please feel free to check out the shinehopecompany.com where we list all of our resources around how to hope. We have a lot of free programs for how to hope, including the five day challenge, our hope infographic with a lot of skills that showcase how to hope and articles of how to incorporate hope into your life. We have the Hope Beat Weekly, which is a weekly newsletter that shares strategies for hope. We have a My Hope Story template, so you can write your own hope story today. Uh, also My Hope Hero, so we can share what our heroes are doing to activate hope in their lives. And this is especially good with youth so they can start looking up to people that have overcome similar challenges to them and seeing how these heroes use the Shine Hope framework. We have a Hopeful Minds for Teens program, a Hopeful Minds Overview, Educator Guides. We have a new evidence-based college course so you can activate hope on the college campus. There are programs in the workplace overview courses, 90-minute courses for learning the what, why, and how to hope. What I want you to know about hope is it's a skill. You've got to practice these skills to become hopeful. It's easy to fall into despair and helplessness when we deal with challenges in life, and it takes intentional work and practice to get to hope. And yet it is always possible. So no matter what life brings, keep shining hope. Thanks so much for listening and have an awesome day. And of course, I've got to add this, that this program is designed to assist you in learning about hope. It should not be used for medical advice, counseling, or other health-related services. I, Fred, the Shine Hope Company, and myself, Katherine Getsky, do not endorse or provide any medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. I am not a medical doctor. The information provided here should not be used for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition and cannot be substituted for the advice of physicians, licensed professionals, or therapists who are familiar with your specific situation. Consult a licensed medical profession or call 911 if you are in need of immediate assistance. And be sure to know the crisis hotline, 988, if you are in need of support. Thanks a bunch for listening. Take good care of yourself and keep shining hope.